the expansion of the universe suggested the possibility that the universe had a beginning at some time in the past. The point at which the universe may have started out became known as the Big Bang. The first year he was at St Albans School, he came, I think, third from the bottom. So I said, well, Stephen, do you really have to be as far down as that? And he said, well, a lot of other people didn't do much better. <laughs> he was quite unconcerned. Somehow, he was always recognised as being very bright. And in fact, they gave him the Divinity Prize one year. That was not surprising, because his father used to read him Bible stories from a very early age, and he knew them all very well. And he was quite well versed in religious things, although I don't think he makes a very great deal of practice of it now. Everybody used to argue theology. That's a good, safe subject. You don't need any facts or you know, distracting things like that. If you go in for arguing, you know, debating, you can quite happily debate about anything, including theology and the existence or, or otherwise of God. And then someone gets bored or journey into space comes on or something like that. The argument breaks up. In an unchanging universe, one can imagine that God created the universe at literally any time in the past. On the other hand, if the universe is expanding, there may be physical reasons why there had to be a beginning. An expanding universe does not preclude a creator, but it does place limits on when he might have carried out his job. When the family went to India, it was arranged that Stephen should come and live with us for a year. He decided it would be nice that he should have Scottish dancing in the evening. Now, mind you, this was a was a quite an ordinary house, but we had rather a lot of room and a large hall. And so we bought um, some records and a book about what you do. And Stephen took charge. And he insisted that you put on a jacket and a tie. And then he was the master of the proceedings. And Stephen took it very seriously. But then he liked dancing, you see. There were four physicists in my year. Gordon Berry, Richard Bryan, Stephen, myself. I first remember Stephen on an occasion when Gordon and I went up after dinner to his room to try to um, find him. And Stephen was up there with a crate of beer, slowly drinking his way through it. He was only 17. He couldn't legally go into a pub. He'd gone up to Oxford ridiculously early. We used to have what we call a gathering net. We used to organise a, a beer party and, and various things like that to gather all these collar as many freshmen as we could get, you see, to get them to join the boat club. And that's how we collected him, you see. But the question always to Stephen was, um, should we make him a cox of the first date or the second date, you see? Well, coxes can be adventurous, and some coxes can be very steady people, you see. He was rather an adventurous type. Never knew quite what he was going to do when he went out with the crew. I think he used to bring his work down with him into the boat sometimes, you know. The sort of thinking gear was going on different levels. <laughs> we were asked to 
read a chapter, chapter 10, in um, a book called Electricity and Magnetism by Blini and Blini, an unlikely combination, a husband and wife team. And at the end of that chapter, there are 13 questions, all of them final honours questions. I discovered very rapidly that I couldn't do any of them. Richard and I worked together for the week, and we managed to do one and a half questions, which we felt very proud of. Gordon refused all assistance and managed to do one all by himself. Stephen, as always, hadn't even started. But the next morning, he went up to his rooms at nine o'clock. And we came back about twelve, maybe five past twelve. And down came Stephen, and we were in the college gateway in the lodge. Ah, oh, Hawking, I said, how many have you managed to do then? Well, he said, I I've only had time to do the first ten. And I think at that point we realised that it's not just that we weren't in the same street, uh, we weren't on the same planet. I once calculated that I did about 1,000 hours work in the three years I was at Oxford. An average of an hour a day. I'm not proud of this lack of work. I'm just describing my attitude at the time. An attitude that nothing was worth making an effort for. He used to produce his work every week for tutorial, and as he never kept any notes or papers or that sort of thing, on leaving my room he would normally throw it in my waste paper basket. And when he was with other undergraduates at a tutorial and they saw this happen, they were absolutely horrified because they thought, he did this work in probably half an hour, and if they could have done it in a year, they wouldn't have thrown it in the waste paper basket, they would have put it in a frame up on their walls. Because of my lack of work, I had planned to get through the final exam by doing problems in theoretical physics and avoiding any questions that required factual knowledge. I didn't do very well. I was on the borderline between a first and second class degree, and I had to be interviewed to determine which I should get. They asked me about my future plans. I replied, if they gave me a first, I would go to Cambridge. If I only got a second, I would stay in Oxford. They gave me a first. I drove Stephen and his young brother out to Woburn Park and he climbed a tree. He was testing himself out, I think, I didn't realise. And he did manage to climb the tree and to go along a branch of it and to get himself down. I think he began to notice that his hands were less useful than they had been, but he didn't tell us. Univ has these square staircases, which are round but they're square. It was just coming down from one of the rooms. Steve actually fell on the stairs, coming down stairs and kind of bounced all the way down to the bottom. I don't know if he lost consciousness, but he, he lost his memory. We took him to either my room or someone's room. The first question, of course, was, who am I? And uh, we told him, you're Steve Hawking. And uh, a minute later, or right away, he would ask again, who am I? Uh, Steve Hawking. And then after a, a couple of minutes, he, he remembered that he was Steve Hawking. Then we'd say, well, do you remember going down to the bar and having a drink on Sunday night? Or do you remember rowing, coxing on the river that on Monday? And his memory came back gradually until he could remember the previous day's events and then the previous hour. And then by the end of the two hours, he could remember everything. The question was, well, maybe, uh, you know, you've lost some of your mind because of this. And so Steve decided, well, I'll take the Mensa test. We said, of course you'll get into Mensa. But he came back delighted that he was able to get into Mensa. Absolutely delighted. 